Hello and welcome back to Rust 101. Uh, this time we're doing the exercises from module A1. Um, so uh, I think it probably goes without saying, if you want to get the most out of this course, you should absolutely do the exercises yourself before you watch me doing them. Um, if you just want to follow along, then just follow along. Um, uh, all the links to like where the exercises are and stuff will be in the show notes. Um, here are Here's the exercises we're going to be doing A1 language basics, but just before we do, we need to check out the code um, from Git. So we'll copy this link from the uh, installation section. Go in here, git clone this stuff. Oops, typed an extra backslash there. Going well so far. Okay, so now we've got this 101 RS directory. And if we go into exercises, we can see the different exercises. If we go into A1, that's what we're doing today, we can see there's two exercises in there. So let's have a look at what they say in the instructions. So these are, um, if you missed a video, these are, I did two videos on this module A1, um, which are the previous two videos in the series. Um, so these exercises are basically going to take us through that stuff, the kind of basic Rust um, language stuff um, that we learned in, uh, in those videos. Um, so let's have a look. Let's look inside the one basic syntax folder then, as it says. And have a look what's in there. There's a cargo.toml and there's a source. And inside source, there's just a bin and then um, a few different files in there. Um, so let's start by doing what it says. So first of all, it says let's run just the first one. Uh, should we do like that? And uh, most of these exercises have some kind of compile error or uh, test failures uh, that we need to fix. So you can see there is indeed an error. So we'll have a look at the code in a second and figure out how that's going. Um, so it says try and get the example to run and then continue with the next exercise by trying like um, bin 02 and so on and so on. Um, so this was this was to run and we're also we also have to make the tests pass. So basically what we're going to do is go through each of the um, the numbered um, files inside that bin directory, make them compile, then make the test pass. We can see we've got a compile error, so let's have a quick look at um, uh, the actual files like this. So there's not a lot to see in cargo.toml, I imagine, so let's just have a look at the... Oops, they're in bin. The first one we're looking at is 01.rs. And here it is. And um, we've got a main function, which calls this multiply function. And multiply multiplies together two things. And then we've got some tests that check that multiplying works the way we expect. 10 tens are 100, 2 hundred, two twos are 4. Um, so all looks good so far. So what's gone wrong? Well, let's look back at the compile error. Um, well, first of all, it says bracket bracket doesn't implement display. So the multiply function apparently is returning bracket bracket or like no value. Uh, and then like confusingly it's then saying I can't print out um, something that's no value. But really the problem is the multiply function is not returning anything. So let's have a look at that. So here's our multiply function. And we need to tell it to return something. And it takes in an i32 and i32 and multiplies them together. So it seems reasonable to me that we're going to return an i32. Uh, so let's see whether it runs. It runs. Let's try testing it now. And the test passed. Okay, so we've we've solved exercise one. So let's move on to exercise two. Uh, like so. All right, so let's try running that before we get too far into the code. Now, we've got a problem. Uh, okay, first of all, there are unnecessary parentheses around the if condition. Well, let's remove those for a start. Yeah, so in Rust, you just don't need these parentheses. It passes it fine without. So, let's run again. Um, all right, so... It, the if statement expects to be given a boolean, um, but the return type of bigger appears to be i32. So that doesn't seem right. So a boolean is like a yes or no, 
Um, bigger is being used in an if here, so it's expecting a yes or no, true or false. Um, but actually, look, bigger is returning a boolean. So let's change it to return a boolean. And then let's try and run that code. Now we've got another problem, which is that the bigger function is returning a boolean, but what we're actually returning is bracket bracket, or nothing. Um, and that's because there's no code in here. So let's make that go away by returning true, shall we? So we're basically saying A is always bigger than B. So now our code should run. Uh, now it's warning us, and we will ignore these for a second, but it's warning us to say, look, you're not using A and B. And maybe you should be. Um, but other than that, it ran, and it says 10 is bigger than 20, which doesn't seem right. So let's run our tests. Now let's have a look at the tests. So the tests assert, yeah, that 20 is bigger than 10, and not 10 is bigger than 20. So these tests should fail, right, because we haven't written the code correctly yet. So we run the tests, and it says, yeah, one of the one of the tests failed, which is this it biggers test, that's an interesting name. Um, it failed saying, um, it, it says that 10 is bigger than 20, but it should be not. Um, so let's fix our test. I mean, yeah, well, fix our code to make our test pass. Um, so what's the implementation of this method? Well, we want it to return true if A is bigger than B. So we can write that like that. Let's try it. Run our tests. Our tests all pass. Let's try running it as well. Look, it says 10 still isn't bigger than 20, which seems rather more a reasonable thing to say. So that feels to me like exercise 2 is done. Let's check exercise 3. All right, let's run it. Um, okay, first problem. We, we've got two positional arguments in our format string, but we didn't give any anything to substitute in here and here. So that bracket bracket means substitute something in here. So here and here. Um, and we haven't got anything to substitute in. So why don't we just substitute something in that's wrong for now? There's no test in this file, so I guess we've got to do all the work ourselves. So let's just say one is largest and one is smallest and run our code. So now it runs and it prints out one is largest and one is smallest, uh, which is not true. Those are not, I'm guessing what we want is the largest and the smallest value in this array. Um, now I'm not particularly comfortable with writing code without tests to check it works. So let's write ourselves a test or two. And we're going to need, we're going to write a function. Should we write one function that extracts the smallest and the largest in an array? Um, I mean, that could, that seems to fit our use case here. Um, but it's a little bit overcomplicated, but we can practice returning a tuple, so maybe it's worth it. So let's try that. Okay. So let's start with, uh, what do we do if there's an empty array? Um, I guess we should return like uh, an empty result. So in, in a way, I think this test should probably, first of all, check that case. Let's check um, empty array returns none. Um, so we're going to imagine that there's a function. Uh, well, let's start off with um, an empty array. And then we're going to imagine that there's a function called um, blah, which returns an answer. Uh, let's call it big small. And we're going to pass in, let's pass in a reference to the array, shall we? Oh, have we done that? We haven't done that. Let's pass in the array. We'll get to uh, references soon enough. Um, and then we need to assert some things. We want to assert that the first thing in answer, no, we want to assert, sorry, that, um, we want to assert that answer is none. So I think what we want to do is say answer.isNone. 
Now, all of this is just imagined code at the moment, so none of this is going to compile because we haven't written big small. So let's write big small. It's going to take in an array. Um, hmm. Without without using references, this is quite tricky. Did we cover references? Let's double check. Um, I don't think we did. No, we did. Surely. No references here. We talked about ownership. Uh, we talked about memory, didn't we? Like. Um, uh, all this stuff. No, yeah, my references are coming up. All right, so I'm going to have to change how I'm writing this. So let's say that big small takes in an exactly an array of size eight, because then we can do this. But it means that the test I've written doesn't make sense anymore. So here's how we can take in an array of size eight, and we're going to return a tuple of the biggest and the smallest thing in that array. And for now, let's return 1, 1, right, even though that's wrong. Oops, I've missed out the array. So now we've got a big small function written. So now this doesn't make any sense because we're not allowed to pass in. Let's, let's try running these tests. Um, it's going to say, uh, well, first of all, we're not, we don't have big small, so let's bring it in. And in fact, let's say super here. That's the nicest way to do that inside this a module like this. In fact, let's bring in everything in this module. That's what I generally do in my tests. So now we're trying to call big small, but we're passing in an empty array. Um, and oh well, the first thing is that I um, was expecting to be able to answer uh, return um, an option of either this thing exists or it doesn't exist. Um, but now that we're taking an array of size eight, always we know that we'll never get an empty array. So that no longer makes sense. So we should say something. Let's assert something about answer that is more um, like what we need to do. Let's say the first answer should be, let's say, one. The second answer should be two. So we're imagining the answer is a tuple. This is the way you get stuff out of a tuple. You say dot zero dot one to get the first and the second thing out of the tuple. So now when we run our tests, um, we're, yeah, so okay, so now we got the error that I was expecting to get, which is that we passed in an array of size zero, and we're expecting to pass in only ever an array of size eight. Um, so that is because we don't have references yet, so I can't show you how to pass in a reference to an array that could be any size. So instead I've said here we're passing in exactly an eight element array, which is a weird thing to do. You probably wouldn't normally do that. But here we're going to do it. Um, so let's make an array. Um, why don't we just put in eight? How many is that? Eight zeros. And then we, we should expect that the biggest and the smallest, and both in those cases, is always going to be zero, right? Um, okay, so our tests now compile, but they failed because we're getting back a one and we're expecting a zero. I also think I saw a warning. Yeah, there's a warning here that big small doesn't actually use array. But yeah, that's fine because we, we know we're not using it yet. So we'll leave that for now. OK, so um, let's make our test pass, shall we? So let's always return 0, 0. And then our first test should pass. We also need to rename our test or something useful. So that did pass, by the way. That's what that is saying. Um, so now let's rename this to array of all zeros. Array of, whoops, all zeros returns. Zeros. We could maybe give this a more meaningful name, like um, the biggest and the smallest of an array of zeros are both zero. How about that? Biggest and oops, I can't type today. Smallest of array of zeros are both zero. That still fits in my eighty character limit, so I'm happy. Um, all right. So now let's write a harder test. What about? Um, Biggest and smallest of all, an array of all ones, is a one. Uh, I know maybe this is a these are silly tests, 
Um, but this is like, the, to me, the smallest step I can make that um, will give me a failing test. So when I run that, um, it fails because um, we're still just returning zero, zero every time. So let's try and implement our code in a way that makes this a little bit better. So why don't we just run through the array and find just the biggest thing for now. So let's say let um, equal, now what we could do is make this be like the smallest possible number. Or we could let it be empty. Um, what's the nicest way to do this? I guess it's to say, um, let it be nothing. And then we're going to loop through. Um, all the things in the array. What we're going to return, by the way, is biggest comma biggest right so we just we're not worrying about the smallest we're only worrying about the biggest for now uh, and then then we're going to say in here if if biggest is already set you see if biggest is not set so what we're going to say is if biggest is already set do something otherwise biggest is definitely going to get set here to um, I, the thing in. So what we're doing is we're looping through all the things in an arrow. We're putting each time around the loop, we're putting the thing in arrow into I. And then we're saying if we've already set some kind of biggest, instead of it just being none, it's now some, something, then we'll do something which we haven't done yet. Otherwise, if it's none, then this thing we've just encountered definitely is the biggest, right? And we've left a deliberate bug in here, by the way, which we'll get to. Um, this is quite annoying. I don't think I want to do it this way. Let's do it this way. Um, let's just say, if we're the first time round the loop, if first, then we definitely set biggest. Um, to I. Otherwise, we only set biggest under some conditions, right? So let's work that out as well. So, uh, oh, and we need to set first to false as well. Um, so what we're saying is, first time around the loop, biggest isn't going to have been set yet, so we need to set biggest to i. Um, otherwise, uh, biggest has been set, so we need to check. If i is bigger than biggest, biggest equals i, right? Yeah, let's try it. Um, okay, so we've got a problem, which is um, it's saying, oh, what if the for loop only runs zero times? Then we'll never have set up biggest. And then we're trying to return biggest and we haven't actually set anything in there. Now, we know better than it because we know this, this for loop will always run. But let's keep it happy by just saying biggest is zero. doesn't matter what biggest is. That will always get overwritten, so... The compiler is protecting us from something it doesn't need to at this point. Um, but yeah, let's try that. Okay, so... Um, all right, it's warning us about how our main code isn't yet calling big small, so maybe we could fix that. But our tests, both our tests are passing. We haven't written enough tests yet. So let's fix this first. Let's say... Let big comma small equal big small input and then we're going to print out big comma small now the code we've written so far is going to allow, allow us to run this and see the output right so let's try running it so it says 94 is largest and 94 is smallest which is not right but not too far off Okay, and our tests are passing, so let's try a more general test. Let's try. This is just, I think, is just going to be a, like a random. I think I feel like we're getting to writing the test that is just the kind of it works test. Biggest and smallest of uh, random array are correct. Let's just say, I can't think of how to name this test. 
better. So let's try. So I'm not going to use any negative numbers or anything like that. I think it will work, but um, I don't want to think about um, any of that because our uh, original test case doesn't um, uh, doesn't contain any negative numbers. So let's not go beyond the scope. All right. So what we've said is now uh, one is a little bit of a boring number, isn't it? I thought we could have a repeat just to make life easier. Well, let's not repeat the smallest though, shall we? Let's repeat something else. Uh, just in case, like, in some case, some way, repeating makes it come out as the answer. All right, so um, so the first one is the biggest, so that will be 900. And the second one is the smallest, so that'll be three. So by the way, let me just talk through what I did here. So this big small is returning a tuple of i32s like this um, but what you can do in Rust is say is write your let statement as a kind of a tuple as well it kind of unpacks those two um, bits of the tuple into two variables called big and small which is why we're able to use big and small here so that's what I was doing there I was very deliberately not doing that in the test to demonstrate to you that big small does return a tuple and you can get the things out of tuples by saying dot zero and dot one. All right, so we've written a test. We think this test will fail. Let's run it. It did fail. Um, we got back a 900 for the smallest, and it should have been a three. So I think there's probably a couple of other test cases we would want to write here, like the, fir the very first thing and the very last thing in the array being the biggest or the smallest would be the first thing I would check. Maybe some other test cases. In this case, though, I think, I think we're OK. Um, we're not writing production-ready code. All right. So how are we going to modify our big small function um, to be, get the smallest as well? Well, it's definitely going to oops, it's definitely going to have a smallest variable, isn't it? And it's going to return biggest comma smallest. Um, and I guess the first time around the loop, the biggest and the smallest are going to be i. Um, and I guess we'd maybe want an else. Um, it's, it's never going to be bigger than the biggest and smaller than the smallest, right? So I think we can do an else. Because uh, the first time around the loop, we set it to be, we definitely set both of them to be identical. And then from then on, if I is bigger than the smallest, it's definitely not smaller than the smallest. So we can make this an else, else if. All right, so now we've found the biggest and the smallest, hopefully. Let's run our tests. Our tests pass. Let's run our main code. It says 94 is largest and 12 is smallest. And if we check back, it's right. 94 is the largest, 12 is the smallest. All right, so uh, that took a while, didn't it? But that was exercise three. Uh, let's check out exercise four. Now, this has got some compile errors. So let's run this, find out why it doesn't compile. All right, a few things wrong. So first of all, um, Uh, something's gone a bit wrong. So first of all, it's saying unexpected parentheses surrounding uh, things in a for loop. So let's get rid of these. These just shouldn't have been here in the first place. Maybe that will make some of the other errors go away. That thing about I expected a, a bracket or something. So let's try it again. Okay. So now we've got a problem that the the two types of the um, two sides of the if and the else um, are have different types and in fact what it's saying is look n times 4 is an integer but n times 3 semicolon is not an integer it's no uh, like a sort of void return type so um, you can see we've got the highlighted error here so let's just remove the semicolon which I think was a typo oh it's reformatted my code apologies my editor automatically reformats so it jumped around so nothing else changed there. We just we just got rid of the semicolon. So now we're saying if n is less than 25, multiply n by 4. Otherwise, multiply n by 3 and then print out the answer. So let's run it. Uh, and it prints 40, 80, 90, 120, which seems right. First, The first two get returned by, get multiplied by 4, and then the next two get multiplied by 3. All right, so that was pretty simple, right? Just a couple of syntax errors to fix there. No tests. We won't write any this time. 
Okay, so now let's look at exercise five and try to run again. Uh, what does it say? Okay, so we've got a problem with looking for an I inside a data. So let's have a check of this. Um, all right, so data is an array and we're saying loop through. So this means I should start off being zero and then go up to uh, zero, one, two, three, four and stop before five. Uh, and we're, what we're saying is we want to get like, we want to get the I thing out from data. Um, oh, sorry, we want to, yeah, here we want to get the I thing out of data. And we, we want to call the flawed half function and then put that value back in. So this is not the way you get the I thing out of an array. This is the way you get um, something out of a tuple and it'd have to be an actual number here. So if we want to get the I thing out of an array, this is how we write it like so and now let's compile again because we're not there yet so now it's saying flawed half um, is returning as you no know, uh, uh, like a void return type oh, I wish I could remember what that, that's called oh, that sounds really clever um, and uh, data is expecting an i32 number to be put in here as the as the i thing in data so let's look at what flawed half returns yeah so flawed half doesn't return anything is what this is saying this um, so we want to return, well, what do we want to return? We have to return an i32, I guess, um, like this. Uh, and the, I can already see that this isn't going to work, but let's get, get there later. So let's compile again. Now it's saying you can't modify data because it's not declared as mutable. We're trying to modify the stuff in it. It's even suggesting what we should do, which is we should make data mutable like this so now when we run it all runs except um, it doesn't do the correct thing do we care I think guess we care um, surely we care uh, or maybe this does work maybe this does work let's print out the answers shall we um, I didn't know you could divide an i32 by a... Oh, sorry, an i32. Of course, yeah, these are integers. I was getting confused thinking this was a float. All right, so we're dividing we're dividing the stuff that we've given by two. So let's print out the answer and figure out what happens. Um, I think if we try and print out an array like this, it will just print out in a nice way. Let's try it. No, it doesn't like that. Um, well, let's print it out. Print it out as debug. Does that work? Okay. So I don't think you've seen this colon question mark yet, but this means um, if this data type implements this thing called debug, which means like display it for me in a nice way for debugging, um, then print it out here as that debug type. So let's try running it. And we, what we got back was eleven six six eight nine. So let's look at whether that's correct. Eleven six six because it's flawed. Eight and nine. Yeah, that looks like it works. So it looks like we fixed flawed half to do what it's supposed to do. I would really be a lot more comfortable if we'd written some tests for flawed half. Um, but since we didn't modify its implementation, we won't do that right now. Okay, so that was all um, the exercise one things. So let's flip back to the instructions, see what they're telling us to do. So now we're moving on to section two of our exercises on move semantics. Uh, apparently adapted from an exercise by Rustlings. Um, so there's only one of these. So let's have a look in that directory. Um, so let's get out of our Vim, go up into Move Semantics, and here we'll also go up into our Move Semantics directory. And let's have a look around. So we've got the same kind of stuff. Let's have a look at. Um, oh, there's multiple exercises in here. I was wrong. All right. So here's our first one. So let's try running it, shall we? Oh, Rust Analyzer is not happy. Um, so let's run exercise number one. And it says S1 is hello world, and S2 is hello world, ex sorry, S1, and then S1 is hello world exclamation mark. Okay, so uh, there don't appear to be any compile errors in here. Let's just double check what we're supposed to do. Should compile, but you have to make sure the others compile as well. Instructions are included as dot comments at the top of the file. Okay, so no instructions in here. So I think this is just some kind of demo. So let's have a quick look at what it does. Um, we make a string, 
and then we make a mutable string s1 by calling append to string which is this function here uh, and then we print out um, uh, oh yeah okay so this stringify just means give me the name of s1 so that I can put it in here and this is and then the second half is printing out just the contents of s1 so essentially that's what prints out s1 equals hello world and later s1 equals hello world exclamation mark so what we're saying is add some stuff onto s1 this exclamation mark do the same stuff again printing out the name of s1 and s1 and it should now have an exclamation mark at the end and then let's look at briefly at this append to string function so what this does is it takes in an immutable string returns a string that, that it gives ownership of um, so it takes ownership of this string that it's been given because it actually took ownership when it was passed in and then it modifies it so what we're saying is we pass in an immutable string we take ownership of it and it becomes mutable then we modify stuff so this um, because this is this s0 is the thing that, that wasn't mutable uh, and that s0 is kind of gone after we call this function you are allowed to do this right so because it, we took ownership of that string um, sorry about the noise and um, because we took ownership of the string inside here because this the string came in here we can we can move it into this s which has the same name but is a different variable which is mutable if you think that's a cheat um, leave a comment and maybe I'll try and explain a bit more it, it would be a cheat if if we used s0 later or something like that but you can't because it got passed in here its ownership got passed okay so here was a, here is an exercise with some instructions it says make me compile without changing line 11 but by moving line 8 oh and here they also explain what stringify does which just as i said just gives you the name the name of the thing all right so um this currently doesn't compile let's just see what it prints out when we try and compile it on the command line so what it says is you you tried to borrow s0 but s0 has already been moved it got moved when we called append to string okay we won't listen to its advice yet we'll try and work it out okay so here we make an s0 we pass it into here and then later we try and print it out um, uh, but it's but s0 has already been given away and it says don't move, change line 11 but move line 8 okay we can do that so basically if we're going to use up s0 and not be able to use it anymore that's got to happen after we've used it so we're using it on line 11 so let's delete that and let's do it here instead so now we're, we're only using up S0 and passing it into a pen to string after we've used it here, where we don't actually use it up here, we just borrow it um, to print it out. Here is where we actually give away ownership of it. So now if we run that, it works okay. It says S0 is hello and S1 is hello world. So that makes sense because we set S0 to be hello here, then we printed it out, then we made S1 from it by taking ownership of it which is where we added on the world part. We returned back that thing, which is what ends up in S1. Then we added an exclamation mark on the end. Then we printed it out. So that's why it works out like that. Hopefully it all makes sense. Let's look at exercise number three. So it says, make me compile without adding new lines, just change existing lines. Okay, so let's look look at this code. We, we make an S0, then we add on an S1 to it. Oh, I mean, sorry, we take ownership of it and get back an S1, print out S1, modify s1 print out s1 again and the error that we have let's actually try and compile this on the command line um, is you're not allowed to borrow s as mutable because it's not declared as mutable on line 16. so on line 16 we're trying to push hello world into s but s is not mutable um, now it this we own this s so we can just happily make it mutable here and then we return it so if we just say mute before it, it should work let's try it. okay now it works print out hello world and then adds an exclamation mark and prints hello world again uh, all right so that was that was fairly straightforward basically if you want to modify 
s inside this function, you've got to say s is mutable. We already owned it, but we still need to say we want to change it. Kind of protects us from ourselves there. Okay, so last one. Refactor this code so that instead of passing s into the create string function, the string gets created in the function and passed back to the main function. Okay, so at the moment, create string is we're taking in a string here, this s0 that we've created. So why don't we just delete this? We don't need this s0. And let's make create string not taking as well. This already doesn't take in any arguments, right? So we don't want to pass in s0 anymore. So what we want is for create string to give us back a string, then we print it out, then we add world on it, then we print it out. Okay, so we're nearly there. We've got um, we've got a string that we we're wanting to take ownership of a string here, um, but we actually um, we've got nothing to take ownership of now because we've got no argument. So why don't we just make a string here ourselves, like this? So we could have used string new. Um, we could have used string from to make it from something with some stuff in. But that's not so good. Now we're getting a warning, um, which we'll fix in a second. First of all, we'll run it. Oh, whoops, I need number four. Um, so we got that warning, as I said, but look, it prints out S1. Uh, oh, look, this isn't quite what we were expecting, right? It prints out an empty string, and it prints out a space world string. And it looks very much to me like what they're expecting us to do is make a string like this. So now it should print hello and then hello world. Yes, it does. Now the last thing is it's warning us here and saying this variable doesn't need to be mutable because we're not actually changing s. So we could change s. We could say string new and then add on a hello. But let's make it look like this. So now we're just saying make me a variable called s and then return s. That should work just the same. It does. But even easier than that if we wanted to. We don't even need to make this variable and then return it. We can just return this expression except I've, had, I've left my semicolon on the end, so now this um, doesn't return anything. But if I remove the semicolon, this whole expression now is the thing that's getting returned from create string. Should still work. All right, so that was it. Is that the last exercise? That's the last exercise. Okay, so I think that's all we've got for um, the exercises for uh, module A1. Um, hope that was helpful. Um, leave comments um, about how to do this stuff better, or if you just think doing the exercises is pointless, um, maybe I won't bother. Um, but I kind of like actually typing in real stuff and you seeing um, how it works in practice. Uh, if I went too fast, if I went too slow, let me know. Uh, next time we'll be doing some stuff from module A2, um, including kind of references and stuff like that, um, which I touched on at the beginning. Um, yeah, I uh, hope you enjoyed and see you next time.